Conversations on ThinkTech's live streaming network series. I'm your host, Grace Chang, today here with Pierre Aslan, professor of history at Hawaii Pacific University. And we're going to be talking about Fidel Castro and his role in history. Um, welcome, Pierre. Nice to have you here to talk to us today about the uh, late Cuban leader, Fidel Castro, who just passed away a few days ago. Very, very happy to be here. Very happy to be here. Um, and you're a professor of international history, especially the period of the Cold War, where it, you know Cuba was a, a critical player, especially after the revolution in 1959. And, and of course, Fidel Castro was central to this to this period, as well as to um, you know revolutions beyond the Western Hemisphere. So this is something that that I think that uh, you know we want to recount because uh, many people regard him as sort of the last iconic revolutionary period from the 20th century just passed away a few days ago at the age of 90. Um, so we're kind of, you know, sort of an, the end of an era yeah. that, that was very dramatic in modern history. No, absolutely. I, 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 so, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a U.S. diplomatic historian, and I, I'm, I'm also an international relations historian. Uh, with a f and I, I've, I've been focusing on the Cold War, and, and, and over the recent past, I've been very, very interested by, 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 by the internationalism that a variety of different leaders in, in a number of different countries embraced uh, uh, throughout the Cold War period, particularly during the, the, the 50s, 60s, and, and 70s. And, and, and Castro really stands out among, among, among those leaders. Um, and, you know, we have an image of Castro in this country that's been shaped largely by uh, 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 Cuban exiles in, in Florida. Uh, among other places, and it tends to be a negative image, um, which is which is certainly justified in light of of some of Castro's domestic policies. Um, more recently, the president-elect referred to Castro as as a brutal dictator, and many Americans celebrated the death of of, of Castro. But but I think what what many people fail to appreciate is is Castro's activities and actions outside of Cuba, which which are considering the size of the country and considering the youth of the, the, the republic Castro would set up starting in 59 uh, are, are really uh, impressive. And, and so, so I, I think it, it, you know, it, it's it important to address that particular aspect of, of, of Castro's role, his, his activities abroad and how they effectively attempted and, and to some degree served to, to change the world. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what are, what are some of these uh, interesting events that, uh, that uh, Fidel Castro had helped to kind of put, move into action in history? So, so I mean, the, 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 the Cubans are, 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 are and Castro specifically, are, are kind of most famous internationally, particularly within the third world, for their so-called doctor diplomacy. Starting in the early 1960s, within, within four years of the revolution, starting in 1963, Cuba starts sending medical staff to, to other countries. It begins in Algeria, uh, and, then, and then from Algeria, the program grows, and, and we see uh, Cuban doctors and other medical personnel uh, working in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa. We see them in Asia, and eventually uh, in, 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 in the Asia-Pacific Pacific region. Uh, Throughout the Cold War period, on average, on average, Cuba had approximately somewhere between 3,500 and 4,000 medical personnel overseas in mm -hmm. any given year. So, so, uh, and and it's 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 essentially philanthropic, right? It's it's mm -hmm. Cuba doesn't really gain anything from it. It's 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 part of Castro's belief. Uh, in, in, in the merits of, of what he would consider revolutionary progressivism uh, and, 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 and socialist, uh, as well as national liberation solidarity. So, so, so we have these, these doctors, this medical personnel being, being sent abroad. Um, eventually, Castro will uh, begin offering full right scholarships um, to um, young people from third world countries, particularly from, from black African sub-Saharan countries, to come to Cuba and study, uh, specifically to study medicine. Uh, 
so that so that so that so that as Cuba assisted those countries, they would become dependent on external assistance, but eventually, in time, would be able to look after their own people by producing their own doctors trained trained in Cuba, and then there would also be uh, a, a rather significant. Um, uh, Cuban military involvement in a variety of different causes, again, particularly in, 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 in black Africa, uh, but also, unbeknownst to many people, uh, in, in Syria, uh, in the midst of the Yom Kippur War. In, in, in 1973, uh, during the October War, Cuba sent 4,000 soldiers to help the Syrians contain uh, the Israeli advance uh, against, against their country. So, so uh, of course, within the context of the Cold War, we don't appreciate what Cuba does because he's on the other side. But, but for the people on that side, for, for people in communist countries, for people involved in national liberation causes, for members of the non-aligned movement, uh, some of these activities undertaken by, by, by Castro are truly commendable and, and must be at least recognized um, by students of international affairs, by political scientists, and by and by and by by historians, irrespective of their impact on on the Cold War uh, uh, bipolar system. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, in in Western countries, I think Cuba uh, after the revolution uh, represents communism, bringing communism yeah. and the Soviet missiles uh, yeah. to the Western Hemisphere, um, and and also you know kicking out a lot of the foreign investments, many of them American. That were in Cuba at the time. So, as far as his, you know, his, his agenda was it to promote communism? Why did he go over to Africa? Why did he go over to the Middle East? What was his interest to spread international communism, like the Soviet Union? Was it in in uh, coordination with the Soviets, or was it an initiative of their own? That, so that, that I mean, that's always a, one of those central questions when we look at small states in the Cold War context, right? Are these smaller states agents of the superpowers? And if, if, if there's one country that, that, that persistently tried to assert its autonomy vis-a-vis -a, -vis a great power, it was, it was Cuba during the Cold War. The, the, because of the embargo imposed by the U.S. against Cuba in, 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 in October 1960, uh, uh, Castro and Cuba will be forced to develop closer ties to the Soviet Union to... to the, the, the socialist camp, uh, if only to keep, to keep their economy alive. But despite the proximate relationship to Moscow, the Cubans will always maintain a tremendous degree of autonomy in both domestic and foreign policy. Uh, Castro will eventually get involved in, in, in Algeria and a variety of other countries, but always on his own terms. Uh, the, the, the largest Cuban military commitment would be made in Angola. Uh, uh, Castro would, would, would send, I mean, at one point we've got 60,000 Cuban troops in, in Angola trying to assist um, a leftist movement prevail in, in a very, very nasty civil war. But what's interesting about the Cuban commitment uh, in, in Angola is that it begins in 1975, but really against the wishes of Moscow. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, 75, the war in Vietnam has just ended. Nobody wants another Vietnam. The Americans and the Soviets as well. The Soviets are committed to detente with the United States. This is supposed to be an, a new era in Soviet-American relations, and yet, and yet here are these conflicts uh, are beginning in, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Angola, and eventually in, in, in Mozambique. And, and leftists in Angola are in desperate need of foreign support. The Soviets provide advisors, but they're very reluctant to provide sufficient weaponry and military personnel because of this fear of compromising the time with the Americans. Can Castro refuses to abide that and effectively, unilaterally, sends in his own soldiers into, into Angola, which eventually compels the Soviets to become involved in, in, in Angola. So, so a state that many recognize as a puppet of the Soviets is really pulling the strings of Moscow in Angola, in Mozambique, and eventually even in, 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 in Ethiopia. So, so it's, it's commendable. Again, however we choose to judge the outcome of these actions, it's kinda, it, it, to me it's commendable to see uh, such a small country dependent on a big power ultimately assert itself 
and, 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 and engage the world on its own terms. And, and that's one of the interesting things about the Cold War that, that, that we need to recognize is that, is that very often these smaller satellite states, often regarded as proxies or Soviets of, of, of the superpowers, were very often more autonomous than, than we believe. And, and in some instances, ended up having more leverage over, over the big powers than the big powers ever had over them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it seems during the Cold War, the two superpowers seemed uh, to want to believe they could maintain their separate blocks and their rivalry and, and manage them in a certain way. For example, you were saying, you know, not get involved in wars in other regions where they didn't think, you know, it would be, it would be prudent given whatever the status of the relationship with. But, but that Cuba, certain smaller states were very committed yeah. to national liberation, which is you know, what it seems in, in particular in the uh, Angola, Mozambique, former, former uh, Portuguese colonies in Africa you're talking about. Because they were, I mean, they were left-leaning, but they were not necessarily Soviet-styled kinds of, of movements. Absolutely not. And, and, and we have to remember also, this is, this is you know, uh, some of these things are, are unfolding within the context of detail, but also the Sino-Soviet split. Uh, you know, Americans often think of communism as monolithic, right? That, that there was just one Soviet-sponsored style of communism. And, and what now we now know on the basis of evidence from uh, 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 former Eastern Bloc countries, from China, from, from Vietnam, that, that communism was never monolithic. Um, uh, that, that each country and leader um, um, that, would, that would embrace communism ultimately embraced its own version of communism. And, and that created tensions within the socialist camp. Uh, the most important of which ended up developing between the Soviet Union and, and China. Very, very nasty split that, that end, ended up splitting Che Guevara and Fidel Castro, which is another thing I think most people are not aware of, that, that close as Che and Fidel were. Mm -hmm. Starting in the early 60s, we see them slowly drift apart in large, uh, 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 re for, uh, mostly because of this Sino-Soviet split. Mm -hmm. Fidel is more committed to Soviet-style communism, which is, which is less inclined to advocate for violent revolution, whereas Che becomes kind of uh, uh, enamored by the, 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 the Chinese interpretation of Marxism-Leninism, which really calls for violent revolution, particularly in the third world. And so, so Che ends up in Africa, uh, in the mid-1960s before returning to Latin America, effectively trying to export violent revolution as Castro tries to be more consistent with Soviet wishes and, and kind of tone down his revolutionary rhetoric and try and achieve uh, uh, change in Cuba uh, on, more, on more peaceful terms. Mm -hmm. And what about within Latin America? Uh, what were the Cuban efforts there as far as exporting revolution or supporting liberation movements? I, so when we look at, at the emergence of leftist movements in, in, in Latin America, uh, uh, and there would be a, a multitude of them starting in the 50s and, and with this high tide in the 60s and 70s, again, for, for many Americans, this was the product of, of Soviet infiltration, of Soviet collusion with local allies. But, but the reality is, is very, very different from that, and it's something we could explore after, after the break. Okay, great. Thank you so much for, for that overview about uh, Fidel Castro as leader of revolutionary Cuba. Uh, Fidel Castro recently passed away at the age of 90. Uh, we'll be back to talk a bit more about his role in history. You're watching Global Connections. Aloha. My name is Carl Campagna, and I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers, the Politics in Hawaii series. Join us each week as we have guest after guest talking about the policy and the politics of our state, of our islands, and of what really matters to each of us. So please join us each week and engage in that conversation. Mahalo. Aloha, I'm Kaui Lucas, host of Hawaii is my mainland every Friday here on Think Tech Hawaii. I also have a blog of the same name at kauilucas.com where you can see all of my past shows. Join me this Friday and every Friday at 3 p.m. Aloha. Thank you, Hawaii, Asia in Review. I am Johnson Choi, the host. I'm looking forward to see you next month, December 15, Thursday, 11 o'clock, right here again.
Hi, welcome back to Global Connections. I'm your host, Grace Chang, here with Professor Pierre Asselin of Hawaii Pacific University. We're talking about Fidel Castro and his role in history. Um, Fidel Castro just passed away, as we many of us know, a few days ago at the age of 90, and comes to an end of a revolutionary era with, with the death of this iconic peer, uh, leader. Thank you. Come, welcome back, Pierre. Okay. So we were talking before the break about, about uh, Castro and revolutionary Cuba and in terms of its impact in, in Latin America. Yeah. So as I was explaining before break, there's, there's a sense in the U.S. that you know, the Soviets were sponsoring these, these insurgencies, these leftist movements, and as it turns out, that wasn't the case at all. The Soviets recognized uh, uh, tacitly the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, kind of kept, kept a hands-off approach to Latin America because the Soviets recognized that this was America's sphere of influence. The last time it interfered in 62, I, I mean, it had been a disaster, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Beyond that, uh, the Soviets feel that if they don't become involved in Latin America, the Americans will not get involved within the Soviets' own sphere of influence in Eastern Europe. So, so there's this kind of, you know, informal, this, this kind of tacit understanding between the su two superpowers that I'm, I'm going to stay out of your backyard if you stay out of mine. Castro, though, doesn't abide by that, by that particular principle. As far as Castro is concerned, we must push revolution. And, and through the 60s and 70s, we see him effectively trying to promote the sponsor revolution in Latin America. Uh, when Che ends up getting killed in Bolivia in 67, he's effectively there just for that, for that purpose. But this is really a Cuban initiative. This is a Castro-Che initiative that, that, that really defied the wishes of Moscow because, because for the reasons that I was suggesting earlier, the Soviets were very, very reluctant to, to push hard for uh, the, the, the revolutionary overthrow of, of pro-American governments in, in, in that particular part of the world. So, so whatever, you know, the, the Sandinistas in, in Nicaragua, for example, their rise to power is greatly facilitated by, 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 by Castro and not by, by the Soviet Union. So for a small country, uh, Castro, Cuba under, under Castro did realize great things. Uh, I'm not saying they were positive or negative, but great in the sense that they had a dramatic impact on the course, in this case, of Latin American history, Cold War history, and, 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 and the history of the world. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, we often think of the revolutionary period as, as the 60s, the 70s, but um, Cuba also supported some of the, the, like the anti-apartheid yeah. movement in South Africa, um, and South Africa, which was occupying Southwest Africa, now Namibia, until it's in, supporting its independence in, in 1990. So, so Cuba's role throughout this uh, 20th century was quite lengthy and, and not limited to, to the uh, revolutions. Oh, and so, so I, again, right, so Cuba becomes, I mean, is, is, is a devout Marxist-Leninist, but he also believes in, in what the French called tiers-mondisme, like third worldism. He believes in non-alignment. I mean, he, he, he really believes in, in, in improving the human condition uh, particularly in, in semi-colonial areas, in colonial areas and in former colonial, uh, uh, in, 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 in former colonies. So, so, so we see members of a, a variety of, of progressive causes um, around, around the world. So there's much more to him than, again, we, we tend to, to, to believe. And, 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 and while certain, you know, his, his policies uh, and the impact of those policies can, can certainly and fairly be interpreted to, to, to judgment. The fact remains that, that this is an individual who really tried to practice a kind of internationalism uh, that, 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 that we're not really seeing these days. Um, and yeah, we can, we can, we can address that, 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 that issue if, if, if you're so inclined. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, you know, there, we can have different judgments about, about yeah. his, his I guess his way of looking at the world, but it's interesting what you were talking about, um, trying to understand what motivates his actions. 
uh, whether the outcomes were positive, negative, whether you know you judge them uh, positively or negatively. I think that's that's a separate issue. But as far as I think the the kind of internationalism that that Cuba demonstrates uh, under Castro, that's pr that's pretty interesting and remarkable as far as what was the, what was the world view that that motivated that. So, so yeah, so so it, everything I I I've read. Um, about about Cuba, everything I know about Cuba, and, and some of the, the, the latest cutting edge, cutting edge research about Cuba suggests that that this is an individual who's who's highly ideologically motivated. Uh, Castro has a certain vision of the world uh, for for of of of, of, a, of a of a just world, and much of what he does internationally is effectively intended to achieve. A greater level of justice in the world, and, and and again, I'm not saying that that it was it's justice in a way that 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 we Americans might define it, but it's definitely justice in the sense that he and many leftists at the time would would, would have defined it, and and so that, that that's that's truly remarkable that that of all the policies he undertakes internationally, it's very hard to see how some of these could have somehow been purely self-serving. Um, uh, I, th I think I think it's 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 a fair pair. We could almost compare Castro's brand of internationalism to, let's say, Woodrow Wilson's brand of internationalism. Different as the two men were, mm -hmm. each espouses a particular vision of the world, and 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 effectively tries to pursue policies that will attempt to to fulfill that vision. And 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 the United States itself would kind of reject Wilson's vision. And, and we could argue that, that with respect to Castro's own vision, many people would, would, would reject it or refuse to buy into it. Mm. But, I mean, it's interesting since his death, uh, the, the media accounts, you know, of course, in, in the U.S., uh, largely quite critical. Um, and in Canada, you know, the Canadian leader, Prime Minister uh, Trudeau, tweeted something positive or, you know, something uh, somewhat praise, uh, praising the, the late leader of Cuba uh, and, and the response from other public figures was, was very condemning of him. Um, so, but then you see in the press in other parts of the world, uh, in, in, in Asia, in, in Africa and Latin America, the, the accounts are very, very different. Their memories of him or, or how, they, how they understand his role uh, historically and his impact and legacy are different. So I think that's quite interesting as far as, you know, the different perspectives that we see from different parts oh, of the Oh, yeah. World. I mean, it's, you know, so, so reading the American press, right, I mean, it's, it's not particularly positive. But I was looking at the Algerian press, uh, some, some, some Latin American newspapers, uh, their, their, their websites, uh, the Chinese press, the Vietnamese, I'm a, I'm a Vietnam expert, the Vietnamese press, I mean, it, these glaring accounts of, of, of Castro. I mean, I mean, Castro gave them, tried to, to help them in various ways, despite having such limited resources. And that, that truly counts for something for, for, for these guys. And then, and then you, you, you mentioned uh, uh, Justin Trudeau. Uh, uh, it, it, part of it is self-serving because his father, uh, Pierre actually went to Cuba in '76. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, okay. He was one of the first, yeah, 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 kind of you know Western Bloc leaders to 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 visit uh, Havana and and to meet with Castro. And then and then uh, in 1998, Jean Chrétien, another prime minister from Canada, also went to to, to Cuba. So the Canadians have always uh, been on better terms with the Cubans than than than, than the Americans. Mm -hmm. But I think I think you know looking at this and, and the response, it's important to recognize that you know. Castro may well have been the last great internationalist, mm -hmm. for better or worse. Here's, here's an individual who, like, you know, in the mold of, of Mao, of Tito, of, of even Ronald Reagan, embraced an all-encompassing view mm -hmm. that was meant to, to change the world. Right? The American policy of containment was not limited to the U.S. It was, it was, it was a, a policy undertaken for the sake of improving the world. I mean, um, Americans practiced their own brand of internationalism during during the Cold War, right? But but Castro definitely was kind of on on on, on the front lines of, of of this effort to change the world, and 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 to me it's 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 almost you know it's interesting to see Castro dying, the, the last great internationalist dying, as Donald Trump, an American nationalist slash nativist, gets voted into into office. You know, the, the, the mood these days is very different, right? 60s, 70s, you have kind of a, a slew of leaders who are, who are committed internationalists. Uh, Cold War comes to an end, 
we're searching for ourselves. And, and what are we seeing these days? The, the rise of a new nationalism. We see it, you had a great show in the Philippines recently, Duterte in the Philippines, Xi Jinping in China, a, a new brand of Chinese nationalism, complete distance from, from Chinese internationalism. Poland, Hungary, which during the Cold War really bought into the, this concept of proletarian internationalism and social solidarity, now have gone the way of, 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 of nativism. And most recently in the United States, the US, which since 45 has been extremely engaged in the world, has tried to, to press for policies that were meant to benefit everyone, again, for better or worse. Now, you know, under, under Trump, quite possibly moving away from this to follow a more unilateralist, a more nationalist foreign policy. And I, I, to me, it's, it's, I think that, that's why this show is, is a great idea. We, we need to recognize Castro as the product of an era and quite possibly recognizing his death as, as marking the literal and metaphorical end of, of, of that era, just as this era of a new nationalism mm -hmm. seems to be asserting itself. Mm -hmm. So the end of the, an era of internationalism, which I think right. you see in many third world uh, country presses, they, they, they recognize Cuba's role throughout the world, national liberation, other movements, um, but with his death, not only the death of a revolutionary, but you're saying the death of internationalism. I, well, I, I, I hope not, but it seems to be, instead of trying to help the world, now we're into helping ourselves. As if we look at, you know, the yes. U.S., the Philippines, and, those, and China, you know, and, the, and Russia also. Very interesting interpretation. <laughs> thank you very much, Pierre. And that was great. Thank you all for watching us here on Global Connections. I'm your host, Grace Chang, and you can come and see us again here every Thursday at 1 p.m. Aloha.